In 2010, Jennifer Daughtry was a 30-year-old living in Mount Pleasant, Pennsylvania with her loving mother, sister, and stepfather. While going about town, Jennifer had started to visit a new community center. This is where she met 17-year-old Angela Marinucci and her 23-year-old boyfriend, Ricky Smearns. As Jennifer commuted back and forth from her home in Greensburg, she began to hang out with Angela and Ricky at their apartment, which is where she was introduced to their roommates and friends. There was 20-year-old Amber Meidinger, who was pregnant with Melvin Knight's baby. Melvin had become friends with Ricky after serving time together in the same jail. Upon release, they remained in contact with one another, and Ricky said that Melvin could crash at his place for a while. Finally, there was Peggy Darlene Miller and Robert Masters, who were also living with them. But among all these people, it was Amber who Jennifer came to trust quickly, because she recognized her from the West Place, a center in town for people with special needs. Amber revealed that on February 8th, she met Jennifer and Ricky at the Greensburg bus station, where Jennifer revealed a big secret to her. Jen came over to me and started talking about her marrying Ricky, said Amber. Amber then met with Angela that same night, where Angela revealed that Ricky said he was leaving his wife for her. The love triangle, now a square. But this news actually wasn't that surprising to the group. Whenever Jennifer used to hang out with all of them, Angela noticed that her boyfriend used to flirt with Jennifer. Apparently, she also overheard Ricky talking to Jennifer on the phone and proclaiming his love for her. With her own challenges she was having trying to pry Ricky away from his wife, Angela was starting to get really jealous and insecure. So she confided in Amber before giving her boyfriend an ultimatum. You have to make a decision, said Angela. If you pick me, you have to get rid of Jennifer. This conversation would be the start of the infamous Greensburg Six. Over the next few days, Ricky led two meetings at the North Pennsylvania Avenue apartment. Meetings that included everyone except Jennifer. Ricky called them family meetings because they were all living together like a family. And from the get-go, rules were established that only he could call and lead these meetings like a patriarch, with Angela behind him coaxing him along. The first meeting focused on Jennifer's ability to be a mother. This all came about because of the ultimatum that Angela had given Ricky. He was having trouble picking between the two women to help him care for the child from his previous marriage if he were to regain custody. But Ricky specified that he wanted Angela to help get his kid back. And since Angela didn't want Jennifer to interfere anymore with their relationship, another meeting was called. During their second meeting, the Greensburg Six talked about ways they could humiliate Jennifer. After they all agreed on some gruesome and horrible methods, Angela boasted to Amber about how she had already set the plan in motion. She used Ricky's cell phone to send Jennifer text messages, luring her to come over to the apartment that weekend to talk about their relationship together, as well as marriage plans. This takes catfishing to a whole other disgusting and horrific level. They set it all up to look like Jennifer would stay at Amber's for a sleepover, which is exactly what Jennifer told her parents. On February 10th, 2010, Jennifer got her bags ready for her sleepover at Ricky's. The plan was set up perfectly thanks to an appointment Jennifer had in town that day. She misled her parents into believing that after one of her routine appointments in Greensburg, she'd stay over at Amber's and then come home on Tuesday. Jennifer's stepfather, Bobby, said that he and her mother approved and that he'd drive her down to the bus station. Before leaving, Jennifer wrote a note on the back of an envelope for her mother with her friend's contact details, along with the words, I hope that you'll have a good day at work, and I also love you very much. I will talk to you sometime later. After being dropped off, Jennifer gave her stepfather a kiss on the cheek before boarding the bus that would take her to the North Pennsylvania Avenue apartment. These would be the last interactions Jennifer had with her parents. As soon as Jennifer entered the apartment, she was ambushed by the Greensburg Six, and things took a horrific turn.
Jennifer was hit with a metal towel rack, a crutch, a vacuum cleaner hose, anything the Greensburg Six could get their hands on around the apartment. They also punched her, tied her up, then stripped Jennifer and painted nail polish all over her face. Amber has admitted that after that, she led the group into force feeding Jennifer to drink concoctions of urine, feces, cleaning supplies, and prescription medication. During the trial, a toxicologist testified that they had found up to 47 Zoloft pills, Amber's antidepressants, that Jennifer had ingested hours before her death. The brutal torture of Jennifer Daughtry continued for almost 36 hours, with evidence and testimony that Melvin Knight also stuffed a sock in her mouth and forcefully violated her. But Jennifer was strong, and she was still alive. At one point, four of the roommates took a break and left the apartment. This was Jennifer's chance. She begged the two roommates that remained, Peggy and Robert, who both had little evidence of taking part in Jennifer's torture, but still refused to step in. She asked them to let her go before the others got back, but instead the two called for the others and reported on how Jennifer was begging to be freed. This sent them into a panic about what they were doing, and so a third family meeting was called this time with Jennifer right in front of them. In this meeting, they decided to vote on whether they'd take Jennifer's life. After unanimous agreement, Ricky forced Jennifer to write a fake suicide note, saying that if they put the note in Jennifer's back pocket when someone found her, they'd believe she'd done this all to herself. When she was done writing, Ricky and Melvin tied her up with Christmas lights. Angela said they had to be the blinking kind. When they weren't, she got angry, said Amber, and then Angela gave the signal for them to finish their plan. Melvin then took Jennifer to the bathroom, grabbed a steak knife, and as Amber stood by his side and watched, he began to slash and run the knife through Jennifer over and over on Ricky and Angela's orders. In forensics, it was revealed that of the 24 knife wounds, the three fatal ones to Jennifer's heart were what ended her two days of hellish captivity. A fourth and final family meeting was held where the Greensburg Six would decide on how to dispose of Jennifer's body. The roommates agreed and carried out their final plan. They wrapped up Jennifer's body, threw her in a trash can, and carried it a few blocks down the street to Greensburg Salem Middle School, where they left her in the school parking lot. Her body was discovered a few hours later by a truck driver who noticed the trash can by his vehicle. Her naked body was tied with Christmas lights and her feet were bound with garland. A light cord and pink pajamas were wrapped around her neck. The Greensburg Six were arrested soon after, thanks to reports from citizens and other neighbors who had made noise complaints to the police. As both men had been caught for previously convicted crimes and didn't deny their involvement in what happened to Jennifer, Ricky and Melvin were given the death penalty. After giving birth to Melvin's baby and spending time in jail, Amber eventually gave a full account of what happened that night after she was called in again to court. She was practically speaking to Jennifer's family while she was on the stand when she stated that now being a mother, she thought this was the only thing she could do to help the family get what little closure they could. For her cooperation, she was sentenced to 35 to 74 years in prison. Peggy and Robert, who again had little evidence against them for participating in Jennifer's torture, received up to 70 years in prison. Finally, Angela, another ringleader in all of this, being the youngest at 17 and considered underage by law, could not be tried in court as an adult at the time and was therefore given a mandatory life sentence without the possibility of parole, avoiding the death penalty. After several attempts to get her case changed in May of this year, she was finally given eligibility for parole in 2070. I know it may sound cynical, but listeners always remember, not everyone that calls you a friend is a true friend. I'm Brandy, stay safe out there everyone, and always be sure to double check the guest list if you've been invited to a sleepover. See you next time on Killer Bites.